Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for tuning in. In today's video, we're back at the Raw Renovation and we're gonna start finishing the second fix on the main bathroom and start the master on suite. So, the van that unit sinks finally turned up and we're just getting the taps located now. So, again, Lee Froy Brooks onto this, um, I don't believe it's marble actually, but marble effects worktop um, with the rotted waste. So, one of the issues we have in with this is how close the waist is to the bottom of the unit so we're having to fit these these are really handy when you've got hardly any room inside the vanity unit it's a waterless trap so inside you've got that um almost like fanny trap we call them um and to service it you can just pop this out here and clean it so yeah bailey's just getting that one sorted now and we just need to hole saw the back and then through here the one for the master on suites turned up which is a double unit and we actually had a bit of an issue with the waste on this one. So this brand or vanity unit or sink, they give you specific measurements for the hot and cold to pop through. The issue being is the measurement they give you is literally so the waste pipe almost touches the bottom of this unit. So what the problem we've got is in the main bathroom or the master on suite, sorry, uh, the floor's risen up by another 40 mil. So the waste pipes actually were hitting the bottom of this unit. So I'll just take you through and show you what we've done to rectify that. So because the floor levels have come up so much to actually level out the floor, excuse the music, uh, we've had to um, just cut slots here and bring the waste pipe up slightly higher. So it was simple enough for us really, you just have to chunk a coupling on and the carpet will get that repaired. So other than that, we've made a start on this one. Shower's all on here, just covered up because they're getting the first coats of paints on and then we can hopefully come back, start a bit, uh, fitting the bath as soon as possible. Okay, so moving back into the main bathroom, the taps are all located now and as you can see here, there's a slot at the top which made it a little bit easier to connect up the freeway taps because they are a pain in the ass. Um, and now what we need to do is get the water drained down and mark out the holes on the back of this and get this hole sawn through as neat as possible. So we've got the holes drilled through now and the pipes poking out through the centre roughly. Um, that is the lowest point for our balanced cold main so we've got to sort of bag it and cut it there. Uh, so what we're doing now is the unit itself, because we've got this panel in, it won't actually sit totally flush to the back of the wall, so we're just gonna put some packets behind it and then secure it with two screws either side and a washer, and then we can get the uh, isolation valves on. Right, so we've got the waste all connected now and the isolation valves are in position. I need to pick up some half inch to half inch flexies just to get that connected up. But you can see how neat these small little um, basin traps make the job. It is a little bit awkward though because they're quite long, so I've just used um, MNF45 to get that right. What we'll also do, we'll put a shroud around that waste pipe similar to the 15 mil, and that'll just neaten up the whole job. So yeah, this is pretty much done. It's nearly there. Um, I really, really like this sink actually, and the double one next door is gonna be even better. So we can move on to the next job. Okay, so we've moved down to a job in East Sussex now and a good friend of mine, his boiler's broken down. It's an ideal boat, which only last week in the last video, I was big enough saying how reliable they are, so it's just typical. So uh, what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna give it a service first. So I'll get it all stripped down and I'll show you the procedure of doing that. And then we'll work out what the fault is. We believe it might actually be something to do with the switch life coming back from the nest. So normally on the nest, once it's faulty, the receiver light starts um, or stops flashing but it seems to be okay, so I'll get it stripped down and then we'll go from there. Okay, so this was a boiler install that we actually did about five years ago, I believe now, um, when my friend first moved into this property, and it still looks pretty sweet. There's no part L here though, there's no lagging at all. Um, when we first did this, we actually brassoed it all up, and it was only until recently that the, uh, the bling sort of wore away from the pipe, so it's still looking good. It's a garage, so there's quite a lot of tools and that laying around and cables swinging about, but 
everything's all totally fine and yeah happy we'll be able to get the field and everything cleaned as well so yeah hold up well okay so first things first i need to isolate the power make sure there's no 240 volts coming in make sure the case is not live etc and then what i'm actually going to do is obviously isolate the gas remove these two clips here so we've got one at the top uh, one that connects on here and then undo these four bolts remove the electrodes and the earth lead and then this whole thing comes out very similar to a valent uh, again that's one reason why i really like this boiler it's really easy to service the fact that the condensed trap is nice to see through as well you just you can see if it needs cleaning or not if it's full of debris so just little things like that make it a good design prv is accessible uh, Spanish vessel on the right so yeah again I will say these are really good boilers fit a lot of them and yeah we'll strip it out and hopefully there'll be nothing inside okay so I'm just removing this copper section um, from the top of the gas valve going into the fan and it's held on by these like two sir clips so just make sure you keep them safe and there's just literally the two yellow o-rings on this pipe so when you remove it make sure you don't lose them um, there's specific size to this pipe work and yeah you can see one usually will remain on the gas valve so uh, normally just leave that there and then you can push it on afterwards you don't need to lubricate them I find you find it will just go on straight away so don't put any grease on there I would advise right before the burner will actually come out from the housing I need to remove these two cables here off the fan so again make sure you've done all your electrical checks make sure there's no power coming into the boiler or the case once they're removed this will then just slide forward Okay, so this is the first time I've seen it as you're seeing it now, and the first impressions looks pretty good. The um, heat mat can be a pain if that's broken, but all looks in good condition. One thing you want to check is this burner seal. So, unlike the valence, you don't have to change this, you know, periodically. You just need to make sure it's in good condition. Still got plenty of flex in it, obviously from the material that it's made out of. If it's all brittle, then definitely get it replaced. You need to be checking the spark gap on these. So you can see there that is actually slightly warped, I would say, that electrode. So I'll try and just um, tweak that slightly. And be careful when you're doing it because they do have a tendency to snap. So yeah, that's one thing quite common, I would say, on these is replacing the electrodes. The burner itself, though, looks in really good condition. Very rarely see, well, I don't think I've ever seen a Vogue burner with a hole or any sort of cracks in it so yeah it's looking great inside the heat exchanger they actually advise you not to use any chemicals or corrosive material on these you see a lot of people on like instagram and that are like, getting these absolutely blinging and they advise you really not to do that so i'll just give it a brush and a clean out um, you can see it needs a little bit of a hoover most important thing though is that pad at the back that looks like it's in great condition and obviously no water leaks etc so yeah it's looking really good Okay, so I've got my trusty DeWalt Hoover here, little battery powered one, and what I'm going to do is just get this heat exchanger all hoovered out in here, clean up any debris, give it a wipe down, and that'll be done in there. Condensed trap looks absolutely fine, although the water is a little bit murky, there's absolutely nothing in there, which is great. And then I will move on to the filter. So what I'm also going to do is also hoover out the burner. So to be honest, the chances of getting much out are very slim. It looks in really good condition. They do recommend just giving it a quick brush over with a soft brush, but I'll get the hoover over it and clean anything that might possibly be in there. Right, we've got the burner and the heat exchanger all hoovered out now. And to be honest, there's hardly anything in there, which is what you expect with these modern condensing boilers. So if you find one of these is really suited up, you know you've definitely got a combustion problem. Um, so. Yeah, they're generally really good. I know a lot of people, when they come to services, they won't even strip them down, they just chuck the combustion analyzer in, but you do need to obviously take it apart and make sure everything is okay. One thing I would say is I am actually not totally convinced that this um, spark electrode is in the correct position. The spark gap looks too far compared to the others that I've done, so 
just check the local merchants but they don't actually have one in stock so as long as it's operational for now that'll be okay but I will um, make it a priority to get that replaced. So first thing to do is get the burner back on with the four bolts, get it on loosely for now and then start with a copper pipe to get that in position. Sometimes it can be a bit tricky so it's better to leave this section slightly loose so you can wiggle it about if needs to. Once that's in I will tighten up these bolts so either corner obviously like you would tighten anything like this don't just tighten up one side so you can give yourself an issue. Make sure it's equally tightened if you've got a torque wrench um, by all means use that. And then what I'll do is put the electrodes and the cables back in. Okay, so one thing I would do is once you're coming onto the commissioning and your checks, obviously this section here isn't going to be part of your tightness test because it's past the gas valve, but I do always try and make it priority just to spray a little bit of um, leak detector fluid over these just in case you don't get those O-rings fully home. So I just had a slight problem with that top clip. It wouldn't necessarily clip all the way around, but it was because the rubber was slightly twisted. So... Yeah, just make sure you double check that, get your lead detector fluid on there, and then you'll know it's fine. Right then, onto the filter, and one gripe I would say I have with the Ideal Boilers is they come with this type of filter. So I don't believe these are as good as the Magna Cleans or anything that's similar to a Magna Clean where you can actually access the magnet itself. So these filters work where the magnet is almost in a pocket which doesn't touch the water itself. So the magnet unscrews from the top and you can actually pull it out. So one way to know if the system's actually got sludging or you know it's gonna be one that requires quite a lot of flushing through is how difficult it is to remove that magnet. You can almost feel the tension on it when you've got um, iron oxide in the filter. So this one actually, although it's got inhibitor in it, because I know, because I installed it, it does feel like it's got a bit of a pull on that. So I will get a bag or a bucket underneath that and get it flushed through. So the way I flush these is I isolate the filter either side, I remove the magnet from the top and then what I'll do is I'll put either a bucket or a bag or you could connect to a hose pipe if you really wanted to or it's three quarters so a washing machine valve works quite well is then I will open up either the um, top of the bottom valve one at a time, flush it through either side and try and get as much debris out as possible. You can, if you want to, undo it here and try and give it a bit of a more thorough flush, but um, you don't really, in reality, need to do that. So just make sure you've got the magnet out, otherwise all your iron oxide is gonna stay in there. Okay, so just for visual purposes, what I've done is I've got a sample of the water that we're flushing through, and I've actually just dipped the magnet into the water, and you can see the sludge and debris. That's just on this small section of water, so, um, Thanks, Valen. I'm using your Easter egg tin. But um, yeah, you can see it's actually quite bad. I'm surprised how bad that is. So give it a good flush through. Make sure it's all good before I uh, get the heating all back and up and running. So the field was all clean. Condens trap is okay. Burner inspected and seal. Heat exchange is all clean. So everything visually pretty much is done. Uh, I know the flue is okay because I've installed it. So I'll just go and check the terminal as well. And we can do our performance checks. Into the boiler menu we go. So you can see here, it's actually asking my customer to call Ideal Boilers now for the service. So that's actually my fault. You can change this and put your own company details in, which I didn't do at the time. So what I need to do is remove this service interval timer. So again, the menu on this is fantastic. You can see here how easy it is to go through it. So everything is um, displayed nice and conveniently. So you can see here, service company name, that's where I need to put my company in. And down here we've got change service interval. So if I push select and then restart, which will move it obviously to 365 days, set that. And then that will remove that um, service reminder on the face of the boiler. So if we go back, you can see here that's now gone. So right, onto the full find it.
Okay, so I've just activated maximum central heating rate in the installer menu. So you go into service mode on the menu and you can do your uh, maximum and minimum readings. I'll just pop my combustion analyzer there because this actually is cold to touch, it never gets hot here, so it's really good technology. And yeah, we can do a check on the combustion performance of the boiler. If you haven't already checked by this stage, you should be checking your polarity as well. So that's one thing I always check when I come to a boiler file because I've had it a few times where we've got an issue with the neutral and it's causing problems with the actual boiler or the PCB. So it's always worth checking that first. Also, just make sure you can see there on the switch live one that I've got two cables. So on the left, you've actually got a live going out. So that will be my common going down to my nest receiver. And then we've got in, which is our switch live. So nothing's calling at the moment. So obviously we've got no 240 volts coming back on the in on the switch live one. So what I'm gonna do is I'll just turn the hot water on on the nest and see what happens. Okay, so I've just turned the nest on for hot water boost and, and nothing's happening at this stage. So that could be one or two things. It could be that the hot water in the cylinder is already hot because the immersion heat has been on and the stat is not calling for it. So what I need to do is just check this hot water cylinder stat down here um make sure that's okay so basically we're going to turn it out to maximum see if that activates the nest and see if that creates a switch live going to the boiler okay so i've just been fiddling around with the nest and i've actually got power going to the stat now so which is good news and what i'm doing is you can check the link between the um, overheat stat and the temperature stat that's all fine so i have at the moment got power going technically to the brown wire and the two pot valve but the two ports not responding, so I need to open up this wiring centre, see what's going on. Okay, so we just had some absolute nut job come to the door and put his own tools by this customer's front door. And then when I walked out, started accusing me of stealing his tools. Um, <laughs> got no idea what's going on. He's come to fit an alarm next door and he's gone. <laughs> he's gone to the job. Um, or he's knocked on the wrong door, left his tools at the wrong site and then started going crazy saying he's gonna call the police. So if this video gets cut short, it's cause I'm talking to the police. So anyway, I didn't wanna steal your crap tools, mate. Um, right, so basically what's happened is I've actually got power now going to this cylinder stat, which is great, and power going out. So the cylinder stat is working fine. So the water in the tank's nice and cold. That's all good, it's easy to work with. So what I've found is I've got power going to the brown wire, to the two port valve, on the hot water which is that bottom one but it's not responding at all so i've got also got power to the gray so we've got permanent live and common coming in but no switch live going out so that's got to be the problem so what i'll do is i'll go and pick up a new two port actuator get it chucked over uh, changed over and yeah just another honeywell one bites the dust okay so i've just gone to pick up a esi actuator so they will actually fit on the honeywell body so i'm getting a bit fed up with honeywell valves i always have problems with them so let's stick an esi one on there and get this all up and running so these esi bodies they fit pretty much exactly the same as a honeywell actuator you've just got two screws um, that you screw in they provide two new screws as well so just got one on the right um, or one either side, sorry. So you've got one up in this corner, one on the left, obviously vice versa, depending on how your body's installed. So yeah, just get that connected and then I can get it wired in. Okay, so it's all operational now. I swapped out for the ESI actuator. And as you can see, it's got an orange light on the face of this one, so you know when it's working or it's operating. So yeah, it's far superior to the Honeywell ones. They really need to update their design. They've been around for like 30, maybe more years. So. Anyway, that's all good. A little bit of fault finding there, so we'll just come on straight away and I can finish my checks and move on from this job.